is a sketchy. I'm not supposed to know. But so we'll be looking at this topology right now, and I'm using a tool called GNS3. It's like a graphical user interface. It allows you to import routers into them, you know, Cisco, Juniper, Nokia, literally anything. It enables us network engineers and architects to have like a lab scenario, right? You can build labs and learn more with this tool. So basically, I built this lab topology. I have four routers. This is a Juniper router, router one, router two, and PE1. They're all Juniper routers, right? And now this one is a Cisco router. And I'm going to log into each of these so I can show you interaction between Juniper and Cisco and show you like how this routing tables look like and what they look like. Um, basically, going back to our slide, right? Looks pretty much like this. So I'll, I'll have router one advertising these networks, 192 networks. They're all slash 32, so they're single hosts. Router one is going to advertise these networks through the network right router 2 will learn these networks and will send it to router 3 router 3 will be a cisco device so router 3 is going to be a cisco device and it's going to also advertise its own networks that it knows about and this network is a 172 network right so router 2 is going to send this network out going to tell it to router, router 2 and router 2 is going to tell it to router 1 and at the end of the day we're going to test reachability and how i'm going to test reachability is by a tool uh, a, a, a utility called ping it's called ping p-i-n-g enables one to test reachability between systems basically and when you when you send an echo request and you get a reply back that's like shows you that there's somewhat some kind of ping connectivity between those two end hosts basically so yeah let's dive into the topology this is the same topology I just showed you and let's go into router 1 to see what it looks like on the CLI. So now we're on the CLI of router 1 right now. Uh, let me log into this real quick. Resize my screen so you can see it a little bit better. This is a Juniper device, so I'm logging in. Um, I'm going to have a separate video where I'll talk about Juniper CLI and I'll teach you guys how to log into the CLI. But just to show you real quick what I've done here, um, I'm going to load a configuration because I've already configured this environment. I'm going to load it a little bit real quick. Um, so in the next video, we're going to talk about how to configure these routing protocols. In this video, I'm just going to show you the concepts we've talked about so you can see in CLI how it looks like and you can understand what, what has been done. Juniper has a very nice um, utility or a, a nice tool or a nice capability where you can load configurations. So where you've configured something, you can just load it on the device and save it on the device also. So I'm going to load, um, I'm going to load the static lesson. I'm going to load that on all the Juniper routers. So that's router one. I'm going to go into router two. Um, let me set the host name set set system host name to router one for this guy commit that um change in Juniper you have to always say um commit um so that you can commit um configuration from candidate com config to um you know the committed into to the global config basically um so yeah I'll do that on router two also with router two get into the CLI changes um the system name is router 2 already so that's good it says router 2 that's good i'm going to load the config i've saved already for the static lesson i'm going to load that in and do the same thing on pe1 pe1 go to pe1 do the same thing that's pe1 um set system host name i set the host name so it says pe1 pe1 um i'm going to also load config I need load override um, static lesson that's what I saved the file the file as okay cool so um I thought I set the name set system host name pe1 pe1 right so see what I did here I said set the system host name to pe1 
and I click enter it doesn't take effect because the name is still saying VMX right the moment I commit it it takes effect now this name of the device is now P1 right cool so now we have our Juniper routers all configured let's configure the Cisco router Cisco routers right here it needs configuration for static routing so I'm trying to show you guys how static static routing looks like and how it's done on the Cisco routers for static um the Cisco routers it show let's, let's look at all the interfaces you see that it has two interfaces one interface connected to router 2 and another interface connected to P1 right so to see that information on a Cisco device it would be show IP interface brief and you can also pipe it and just to remove some unnecessary information you can say exclude um unassigned unassigned ips enter now it shows me what i've configured on gigabit one slash zero and gigabit two slash zero these are ports and these correlates with these ports right gig one dot zero has this ip address and two dot zero has this ip address so this has been configured and they're both up they're all they're, they're, they're all up right so router is, is looking good also router tree has these loopbacks that it knows about and those are the networks that i want to tell router one about right if i go into router one and check its configuration uh let's say show let's do show this is juniper so show run show route protocol direct now this shows you the direct routes on this juniper router right so basically you can see router one has similar configuration with router tree router one you can see it's um direct ip addresses for these two ports right you can see them now the way i'm doing this juniper the way it works on genus 3 it's kind of weird so like physically on the genus 3 uh it says gigi 7 port 7 but because of the internal wiring um just subtract two from that so when it says port seven on the genus 3 it's actually port five when it says port eight on genus 3 it's actually port six so it's minus two but basically i've configured the physical ports that goes to the other routers right and i'm going to be advertising the 192 addresses as you can see them they're all my loopback addresses i'm going to advertise all those two also so that router one can tell um router three and router three Three can tell router one basically there's an intermediary router between them router two right so router one actually tells router two router two now relays that information to router three and vice versa so back to router three we need to put in some static routes so in router three we know that all the interfaces have been configured right all we need to do is just go into global configuration mode this is how you you um configure like configure things this is how you like you know, tell the router what to do basically you go into global configuration mode I'm going to talk about this in subsequent videos and you say IP route I want to reach to 192.168.1.1 and I want to reach to that address specifically so I put a slash 32 submit mask 255 255 255 255 I would like to reach this network and I want you to go to router 2 to reach that network. So I'm going to put the next hop of router 2, and that is 10.0.0.4. This is a command, a static route config that I'm putting on router 3. And what this simply means is saying, hey, I would like to have a route. I would like to route to 192.168.1.1. One. I have no idea how to reach it um it's supposed to reside somewhere in the network but it's also a slash 32 so it's a 255 255 255 255 subnet meaning that is just one ip address i would like to reach that ip address and i would like to go to this neighbor to reach that ip address that's what this statement is saying so when i enter this now it's in i've told the router that if you want to reach 192 168.1.1 go to router 2 because I'm believing that router 2 would have some information on how to get to router 1, right? You see, this is static routing. I'm manually telling the router where to go and where not to go, right? 
Now, I gotta do that for the other routes that we're trying to advertise. Remember, going back to our topology, Router 1 is advertising three different routes. So I have to put a static route for each route I'm trying to reach. Just imagine you're on the internet and you're trying to put static routes for every single route you're gonna reach. That's gonna be convoluted, right? And that's a drawback of static routing. It gives you control because you can tell it where to go, but it's very, very, very um, convoluted. So now I have to do the rest for the other ones. Now, Cisco has a good feature where you can just hit the up arrow and it calls back the command from history. So this is the previous command that we just did, right? Now I can um, move around with the, with the back, with the left cursor, and now I can go and modify this command. Now I want to reach um, 192.168.1.1 as well, right? 1.11, and I click enter. Now I have two routes now. I have a route to 192.168.1.1, and I have another route to 192.168.1.11. We need one more route. So I do an up arrow also, and I add the third route, and I say enter. Now I've added all three routes to router three, telling it to go to router two to reach router one. That's it. Now, if we go to router two, let's see what it has in the routing table. Router two is a Juniper router, right? I go to router two. This is this is router two. Uh, let's set the system host name. Let's tell it that it's router two. R2. Um, yep. Uh, let's commit that change. See, the name has changed to router 2 right now. So now we're on router 2 right now. Router 2 is like a transit, trans transit router. Now, because we're doing static routing, we also have to tell router 2 hey, for you to reach router 1's network, you, have, you need a static route pointing to router 1. Also, if you want to reach router 2, router 3's network, you also need another static route pointing to router 3. You see how manual it is? So I've already added those static routes already. For Juniper, um, you can see configuration, right? Uh, once you're in the global configuration mode already, just to show, um, show routing options, I can do a display set. So I added these static routes on this Juniper router. Now, Juniper has a Juniper is a, is a different vendor, so it has a different config structure, right? The different vendors from Cisco. So this is how Juniper does its static routes. Now, router two has a static route that says, "I would like to set routing options static route, right, to reach the 172.16.3.3/32 network, and I would like to go through the next hop of." 10.0.0.5 so router 2 is just saying that i would like to reach one of the networks that router 3 is advertising and i would like to go to the next hop of router 3 to reach that so this 10.0.0.5 address is the same as this address router trees interface ip so basically router 2 is saying for me to reach 172.16.3.3 i would like to go to this next hop that's basically what the static routes config is doing right here. Now I did the same thing for multiple um, multiple times for each of router three subnets. And I did the same thing going to the other direction. Now router two also needs a route back to router one. So I said the same thing, set routing options, static route for the 192.168.1.1 network. And my next hub now, I want it to be router one. So basically, going back to the drawing, router 2 also has a static route saying, I would like to reach the 192 address, and I'd like to point it to this interface. That's it. That is static routing. And the moment that is done, let's go to router 1 and see what we did in router 1 as well. On router 1, um, if I did the same command, show routing options, display set, display it in set commands. I have only these static routes on router 1 saying, if I want to reach the 172 addresses, I'm going to the next hop of router 2. Now, let's confirm. 10.0.0.3, uh, comparing that with our topology, 10.0.0.3 is the IP interface of router 2. So router 1 is saying, I don't know how to reach 172.16.3.3, but I would like to reach it. I'm going to ask router 1 for that information, router 2 for that information. So I'm going to point to the next hop. That's basically what it did. Now, now that we have all the static routes on all the routers here on this line, let's forget about the, the one on top, this, this line, right? 
now I have all the information now I can go on router one and say let's test reachability I would like to ping I would like to talk to one of the networks that router three is advertising let's confirm that router three is advertising 172.16.3.3 so I go to router one I would like to ping 172.16.3.3 I would like to source my ping from my own network and my network is what router one's networks are 192.168 right so I can say 192.168.1.1 that's it this is my ping command I will want to talk to router trees address I want to source it from my address and I click enter and see what happens now it tells us 64 bytes from this you get a reply so it sends an echo request I send echo request and it gets a reply and these you see this is a reply replies basically and this shows that router one is now communicating with router two that's it so static routing has been enabled and routing is working fine now this is just this is just just like you're on in, in your home home computer right and you're like you know, you're working you're working for on your computer at home and you have wi-fi and you can reach certain websites on the internet you can reach google.com you can surf you can browse you can youtube stuff because you have reachability to those networks right because you're talking to them basically we just we just demonstrated how router one is now talking to router three successfully so that's static routing but you see how how difficult it was right it was very convoluted okay now but we know we got it working let's move on to the next protocol i think that should be let's try hmm let's try rip next oh, oh let me show you the routing table so on router one I pinged router tree, right? Let's go to router tree so I can show you how the ping looks like as well. So in router tree, we can do the same thing. Cisco router, right? Uh, show version to show you the, the, the type of device, the version of the device. This is a Cisco iOS software, 7200, basically. Cool. Now we can do um, show IP routes. I would like to see the routing table. That's what that command says. Enter. Now it shows you the routing table of router tree you can see all the connected routes you can see the local routes now you can see the static routes that we just added pointing to router one's network that's it now it knows to go to router one's network because we have added these static routes now we can ping if you want to ping router one's network and we source it from our own network our network is the 172 address now router 3 it's trying to ping router one from its own addresses. Enter. Now the ping output on Cisco is quite different from Juniper, but as you can see, it's a success. It says success rate is hundred percent. Uh, it gives you a round trip delay timer, and it says it's hundred percent success. So you can see this means that it's successful. It sends five pings, and if they come back successful, it reads like this. So Cisco device can ping Juniper. Juniper can ping Cisco successfully. Now back about um now talking about static routing, right? So why would we even need dynamic routing protocols? Why can't we just use static routing, right? Right? But there's a very, very good reason for that. So static routings, they don't really account for link failure so easily. Because static routing, you're manually telling the router, go here, go there, go there. You know, like it's a manual intervention. I showed you on the CLI how to configure um, static routing, right? Um, but it's so manual and it can get so complicated. Like it's just a lot of administrative effort. Imagine configuring the internet with static routes. That would be crazy. That's a lot of routes. So um, it's, just, it's just a lot of admin effort. Um, dynamic routing protocols are pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, they're um, dynamic as the name implies. So you can apply... Um, they learn routes dynamically, right? You don't have to manually tell it what path to go. They just learn that information by themselves because of algorithms inbuilt in these protocols. So that makes them more efficient than static routing alternative. Well, every vendor still has a way to configure static routes because it's still, it's still a valid way of creating routing. So you still have that option to do static routing, but you also have options to, to use the plethora of um, dynamic routing protocols made available to you by these vendors.